Well, I guess I'm going to go ahead and kick this thing off. I want to talk about this large-scale deployment of Postgres that we have at HP with our remote support software. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our software, how it works, how we deploy it. And then I'm going to talk about some industry trends that I think are in play here and may be of interest to you. Um, I was going to kick off by saying that I thought we were perhaps the largest user of Postgres on the planet. I don't think that's true now because I talked to the guys from Heroku. I think maybe they're, they are ahead of us on that, but uh, Paul and I have agreed to race to the top as far as being the biggest users and abusers of Postgres. The product that uh, the team that I'm on is Inside Remote Support. This is a product that is there to provide an autonomous entity that runs on your server to monitor the health of your server, and then it communicates over the internet through a secure connection to the HP backend, the HP data center, uh, or to a channel partner uh, that is another alternative uh, service provider uh, to indicate where there, there is a need for any service action. So Insight Remote Support delivers um, support for HP servers, for storage systems, network SAN environments, and even multi-vendor devices, uh, competitors' products, Dell products, uh, other companies' products that are under contract for service by HP. We have a lot of customers that use products from other vendors, and we provide a complete service capability there 24-7. The software that I'm talking about runs like a daemon on your server. It monitors health, configuration of all the devices that are connected. Uh, it discovers what is connected to the computer, what is on the local network, and communicating with the computer. Uh, it advises the status, and of course, it monitors for serviceable events. Uh, faults, errors, devices being powered up, powered down, removed, inserted, and so forth. It notifies you and your support center, uh, and it provides on demand a user, a local user access from the local area network, and it provides alerts by email and other web service protocols uh, when things need attention. It synchronously and asynchronously collects stores, reduces, and forwards configuration and status information right there on site on your server. And it intercepts device events, such as SNMP traps, uh, web indications, um, and that sort of thing. It reads the system, the operating system written event log and interprets it, and it analyzes events uh, using a rule-based program. Uh, this package of software not including Postgres itself, which is a component, uh, is somewhere north of a million lines of code, most of it in Java. Half of that code, or over 500,000 lines of code, uh, is the knowledge base, the rules that are used uh, in analysis. And we use uh, a code generator to generate all that code. That code is, if you will, the client of Postgres. So. This is, for us, a very large-scale deployment. Uh, we, we're pace, placing a lot of reliance on Postgres because it's being hosted on our customers' servers, uh, servers that are in warranty or under service contract. And of course, we're accountable. We have to be responsible for the correct functioning of that system on the customer's server, on your server. And we are not there to administer it. So there's no on-site DBA. Uh, if you will, I am the DBA. I have to write the code, or one of my colleagues has to write the code that autonomously manages the instance of Postgres that's on the customer's server. Every installation contains Postgres. Um, 
I don't know precisely the number that is deployed today because the early versions of this product did not have any kind of a registration mechanism. People downloaded it and installed it. Um, I'm certain that it's over 10,000. It could be 20, 30, 40,000 today with our V5 version of the product. Right now in development is Insight Remote Support version 7. Now in the, in the write-up for this talk, it mentioned version 6. Uh, that one will never see the light of day. That turned out to be a prototype. Version 7 will be released, um, the next iteration. We certainly think that the scale of the deployment is going to go up by a factor of 10 when this thing rolls out. Um, it's going to be deployed on Windows initially. Um, as you can imagine, the vast majority of our customers that are running servers are running Windows, like it or not. Uh, it will initially be in a single node configuration, meaning that it's one instance of our software on one computer node. We have in development the next version, which is will be deployed on both Windows and Linux and will support multiple node clusters. And in that cluster configuration, I mean having in Postgres, having the master standby replication set up. So here's a schematic look at the software. In the center, we have the Insight Remote Support application. This is the client, if you will, of the Postgres database. And over there on the left, you see that it is communicating with OOS, or objects of service, we call it. That means all the endpoint devices that are connected to the computer. They could be in the rack. They could be in another chassis. They could even be in another building. But these are things that we are monitoring, that we are obligated to support and service. So our software is monitoring the events. Uh, it's periodically scanning the network to determine the presence of all the devices, the status of the devices, the configuration of the devices, and reporting that back through our software, which then writes that information into the database. Uh, we also work with channel partners, uh, other companies that provide service, and they'll be able to use this software um, notifications go not only to HP, as shown there on the right, but also, of course, to you, the customer, so that you can receive an email indication or some other format indication of anything that's requiring attention. So I'm often asked, in our shop, people ask me, engineers ask me, why are you using a client server type of a database product uh, as a component of Insight Remote Support? Why aren't you using an embedded database? Because you know the scale of it is relatively small compared to the really large production applications that you might be familiar with, or like you just heard about in the telco case, for example. Um, and so the answer to that question is that, first of all, our software is not a single process. It's a multi-process application running on your server. And so each of those processes is somewhat independent and asynchronous with respect to the other parts of it. So that's the first reason. We have multiple client processes or application processes that are running and communicating with the Postgres server. Then the second thing is we use this client server configuration extensively in development test and, of course, for replication. So uh, it's extremely helpful as a developer for me to be able to go in and, in a, in a development and test setting, inject information into the database and observe the response. And to do that completely out of band with respect to the application that I'm developing. So I can instrument things and monitor things. I can generate faults and, and observe responses and so on. So it's a very, very powerful thing. Of course, we use it in test and, as I mentioned, replication. So I wanted to emphasize in this talk how we deploy it. What we do is 
uh, we take the Postgres executable image, and that is rolled up into our kit, which in Windows, of course, would be uh, like an MSI package. And the installer drops an image of our software into the installation target and then launches it as a, as a Windows service. And all the comparable things in the Linux environment will be done as well, running it as a daemon. During the first time startup, we launch the initDB program and we play our DDL through it. Uh, after after initDB has set everything up with a non-default port and a non-default data folders to run on the customer system, hopefully without conflict, a lot of our customers are using Postgres for the production applications that run on the same machine that we're installing our service support software on. So we, we may actually have the customer's instance of Postgres as well as our instance, which is configured to be as small as possible. So uh, after initDB completes, but before we start up Postgres uh, operationally, we go in and programmatically edit the configuration files, uh, adjusting for security, logging, monitoring, and so on um, to, to the non-default settings that we require. So again, we don't have a DBA on site. We have to do all of this with software that is deployed with the product. So our software, which is for the most part written in Java, launches Postgres through PG control. Only our client software has the login credentials for the database. And of course, when we set it up, we restrict the access in the single node configuration to the local host because it's actually kind of a slave to the client application. Uh, for a multi-node configuration, we set it up so that only the enumerated nodes that are on the local area network can access the database. Security is very important to us. You can imagine the liability that we face in our customer environment deploying this, this tool, which is listening on the network. On boot, our software is included in the startup sequence, and Insight Remote Support starts Postgres first, if it's not already running, before anything else, because all the other components of the application, of course, are using it for persistence. So, is Postgres not running? Postgres is not running as a Windows service. Rather, our client application is running as a Windows service and it launches Postgres as a child process. So it, the, the Postgres instance that we are using, you know, it's, it's totally, if you will, the property of our software, and it's relatively inaccessible unless you happen to have the credentials and know the details. It's inaccessible to other applications. We did, in, a, in an earlier incarnation, we did run it as a Windows service, and we allowed customers to use it as a, as a utility, and I can't even begin to tell you the extent of the problems that we ran into as a result of that stupid decision. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna look under the hood. Now, where we're at right now is we've written specs, uh, we've developed a data model, we've uh, executed a code generator. I'm gonna tell you more about that. Uh, this is for our ORM, Object Relational Mapping. Uh, we have unit tests, we've done integration tests, and right now we're doing kit testing. That, in other words, a complete bundled product in a form as we would ship it. And we're doing that in a, in a, a VMware, a vSphere uh, virtual lab, and we have some tens of engineers, each of whom has their own virtual machine with their own instance of Postgres and their own copy of the program running their own test cases in, a, in a relative isolation so that they can find problems 
and, and fix them and then retest, go through that break-fix cycle in that environment. It's very cool using the, uh, the VMware vSphere environment. Um, next, we have system integration test. Um, and then after that, we have a user acceptance test. I depicted that in black and white because that's when a go, no go decision is made about shipping. And uh, then finally, release, of course. Our development environment currently is comprised of uh, Java 1.6, standard edition, not the server, not uh, the um, EE edition, but the uh, SE edition. We're, we use predominantly Eclipse as our development platform. Uh, the Helios version 3.6 and uh, 9.0, although the day I was heading for the airport to come for this conference, of course, 9.1 was, was uh, made available and I deployed it and left town. So I hope it works. <laughs> no, actually, I did test it. I ran about 3,000 unit tests on, on it against it and it worked fine. I had previously tested the release candidates without any difficulty, so it should go well, although I got a nervous email message from the guy who builds our kits, who does our installer, saying, are you sure that you've tested this because we're going to roll this out to the next level of testing unless you pull the plug, et cetera, et cetera, and I wrote back, no worries, I'll be home soon. So, uh, I. I would imagine that within the next year we will we'll move to Java 1.7, uh, that we'll move to a newer version of Eclipse, but for those of you who are Java developers, you might know that there's some plug-in incompatibilities, some plugins you can't run uh, that were developed for Java 1.6 and they don't work with 1.7, so that's kind of an obstacle right there. Anyway, that's our that's the basics of our client application development environment. Uh, schema development, we have uh, a few product architects and designers who write the specs. They're pretty much done with that. They define the data, the data structures that they want, um, the entities, the tables, the columns, the data types, the constraints, all of that is, is written and reviewed. Then we're using the uh, the old and venerable Irwin as our data modeler. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to use this old product with Postgres. Um, my first impression was, oh, we can't use it because it doesn't support Postgres. But actually, if you, if you select ingress as the, as the database type, and if you're willing to do a few seconds of editing when it generates the DDL from your data model, it's more than adequate for the purpose. So we use um, Irwin, and I, I and one other guy on the team do most of this ourselves. We take those specs, we pound it into Irwin, we create the data model, we do a few little fudges between the logical and physical data models as necessary, uh, and then we push the button, and Irwin exports an XML form uh, of the data model, which then goes into our code generator, our which we use for object relational mapping. Um, it generates Java code then from that XML. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, we're using IBATIS for ORM. We generate Postgres specific physical data access code in Java. We actually have an option in the code generator to do the same thing for Oracle. Those are the two things that the two vendors that we support at the moment with this code generator. And no, it's not a public product. I'm sorry about that. But this product is used internally in our in HP's IT division quite extensively for our own internal um, operations, which is why we're using it for this product because it was received wisdom from from our IT people. Um, and what's very interesting about this code generator is that it generates unit tests, client level tests of the whole stack. And uh, it's, it, 
initially might seem a little perverse to have a code generator generate code from a data model that you can then use operationally as your API to access all the data. And then why would you need to also generate tests of that same code? I mean, if you get it right the first time with your code generator, why would you need to test it? And the answer, of course, is that the database schema is subject to independent change from the client application software. I mean, we got different people they're supposed to coordinate, but they may or may not coordinate. And so by generating these unit tests, we're able to expose any discrepancies in, in the way our database is constructed with respect to the way the application that uses it is constructed. So our database application architecture really has three levels. We have the business process level, uh, then that calls an API, which is the generated code. And of course, we have two layers, the logical or data service layer, which determines the security context uh, and determines predefined queries, commonly used queries, based on the data model. It just generates the SQL and the, the Java API that's needed to do those common things. The security context is down to a level of an individual thread in an individual process on an individual node in the cluster. And every, every thread has an identity associated with it and every modification of the database um, is, is recorded with the security context for that. And that's very important for us for um, forensic diagnosis when things don't go well we want to know you know where did the damage come from was it a bug was it an attack uh, what kind of uh, situation is happening there so we do record security information the data access layer or physical layer um, is basically Java to SQL we're using the JDBC interface and and we have this very specific Postgres version, which I've modified to add some data types and so on that are unique to Postgres, very handy stuff. Um, so our data model is, right now, last count was 109 distinct tables. Uh, it takes about a little less than three megabytes of XML code to define that structure, uh, it maps to 4,700 lines of DDL, just to give you an idea of the scope and scale of our little database, um, that's what it looks like. Um, every one of the, this is just a, I don't expect you to read it, but this is just a picture of part of the diagram on, using the Irwin data modeling tool. And um, every one of the tables has some audit fields associated with it so that every row of every table has associated the uh, timestamp of update and the, uh, the security context in which it was updated. And this is, this is a form of instrumentation that allows us to track not only who changed what when, but also it's a really powerful way to uh, get us the raw data we need for doing performance analysis. And it turns out that the overhead of adding that to each of the tables is very minimal. So we do it. Object relational mapping, ORM. This I love to hate. ORM is nothing if not a curse. I mean, the, the whole mindset of object-oriented programming and the mindset of relational databases um, is very hard to pull together. I've tried Hibernate. I've tried doing it by hand. Um, and we're using Ibatis now, thankfully, with a code generator in the middle. But um, it's a very difficult thing. So what we're doing here and what's illustrated in this example is a fragment of XML. And this XML, this is what it looks like if you're using um, Ibatis or MyBatis. There's a newer version to do your ORM, and you'll see there 
we'll just look at the, the one there on the top is an update operation and it's taking, uh, it's a template for updating a row in a contact table and it lists all the fields there and those things that you see on the right that are delimited with uh, hash signs, pound signs, those are the free variables in the SQL which are then bound by the IBATA software in response to a call through the Java API. So all the bindings for things that need to be updated go in as arguments to the call in the Java API, then that's bound into these, to this SQL statement and then that's executed under the covers with, uh, through the JDBC interface. So all of the common things that are needed are generated based on the data model like this. Updates, deletes, uh, various forms of selects that are needed. Not everything, however, I don't have a slide on it, but there are some things that have to be done custom, uh, as you would predict, and those just have to be handwritten. However, we use the, the IBATIS um, infrastructure, which provides some level of, of security for us and um, supports the connection pooling, and so, and so we use that with our custom uh, SQL that has to be written for certain operations, usually per, for performance reasons. So we use a code generator for compliance with corporate standards. Uh, it presents a very clear API to all of our persistent data that all the programmers can use. By and large, our application programmers don't want to know anything about the database, and we try to present an API that is comfortable and familiar to them. It's not always the most efficient, however, but one of my hats, in addition to looking after the code generator and implementing the database schema and worrying about security, is performance. And so in doing performance measurement, when I identify, um, let's say, a dumbass use of uh, a select call without any kind of aware clause uh, on a really large table that's causing out of memory exceptions in the client application, uh, I just get my hands dirty and go in and say, well, you know, you need to rewrite this. I have the luxury on this project, this is a great project, I'm having a lot of fun with it, and I have the luxury of working on a project where a year ago we didn't have, this is for the V7 version, we didn't have this database schema. We've created it from scratch within the last year. And so by the same token, the client software is not entirely, but it's about a 60 or 70 percent rewrite. So we have quite a bit of latitude to do things the right way, finally, based on all the lessons that we've learned. Now the, uh, the code generator itself, you might be interested to know, uh, it's not a compiler, it's more like a macro processor and it uses templates, FreeMarker templates. FreeMarker is um, an open source package available on SourceForge. I put a link there. By the way, this presentation, the slides uh, will be uploaded. I'll upload a PDF to our wiki. Haven't done that yet, but I will do so you can have access to this. The links will be live in the PDFs. Unit tests, um, as I mentioned, they generate, the code generator generates unit tests, which exposes discrepancies between the API in Java and the implemented schema in Postgres. Another thing that's very cool is that the unit tests include mock forms that run at very high speed without a real database. When I say high speed, I mean 100 to 1,000 times as fast is using a real database. They're implemented with hash tables underneath. And for doing testing, for testing the logic uh, and the behavior of the client application software, this is, this is terrific because the developer can test in a very rapid break-fix test cycle um, at his desk 
without actually having to go through the database, without having to modify the database schema, um, he can run th with the mock code and do a fairly thorough job. At the same time, uh, we have an auto build system that runs the unit tests against a real Postgres instance as a final check. Uh, the example shown here is um, a, a simple unit test that says it'll fail if you insert a duplicate contact that has the same identity as some other one. And it, the test has shown that it expects a data integrity violation exception. And if you don't get an exception like that, the logic must be wrong because you should get one. So that's just an example of a generated unit test code fragment there. Okay, so that, that's the end of the under the hood look. I wanted to talk a little bit about trends in the industry, enterprise server trends, that goes a little bit beyond just our Insight remote support software, but really what we all face as users of Postgres. I think that the industry trends are gonna transform the way database systems are deployed and used in the future. Now this chart, it, it shows the relationship, it's just a mathematical relationship between a percentage rate of growth, that's the axis across the top, that's a log scale, and the doubling time. So if you look in the middle there, a 30% rate of growth corresponds to a doubling every 2.6 years. Now in the computer industry we have more nodes, more computers, and virtual machines, more processors, more storage, more bandwidth, and we have this rapidly expanding capacity to process data that's, you know, the rates are like 30 to 50 percent per year. This is Moore's Law kind of thing. On the other hand, although there is every day a growth in the number of users, the number of uses of the computer, the, the different ways that you can use the computer, the usage, the consumption of the actual useful information is only growing at a rate of 5.4 percent per year. And that's limited really by population growth by demographics. By demographics, I mean population growth plus consideration of, you know, what part of the world is a developed world and what part isn't even using the computer yet. So our capacity to consume all this information that we're producing is limited to 5.4 percent. So that's kind of a counter trend to this really rapid growth trend of the amount of data that's being produced. So there's this huge gap between the amount of data that's being generated. A lot of it is data that is going from computer to computer rather than from computer to user. But the amount of data is enormous. Uh, but it's not information until it's consumed. It has to be really absorbed by a user in order to be useful information. If it's just data at rest in your Postgres database, it's not information. It only becomes information until that report is being read or some action is being taken or somebody's being entertained by the information that's coming out. And on this chart, this is just um, kind of a naive extrapolation of, of a trend that was observed in this article, I cite the, a link down at the bottom there in InfoWorld. Um, it was stated that over a five-year period that the rate of growth of the data in the world is 650% every five years. So I did the math and I came up with this chart and it shows that the amount of data in the world is 
expanding at this enormous rate from a mere uh, 10 zettabytes in 2008 to um, off the chart numbers, 50 to 60,000 zettabytes in the out years, if you extrapolate that trend. Now, we can argue all day about how realistic that extrapolation is. This is not a forecast. Rather, it's an extrapolation of an observed trend. So do with it what you want. But down on the bottom of that chart, you'll notice that the amount of information is growing very slowly. In fact, because uh, it is growing so slowly in comparison with all the other data on this chart, you'll see that by 2018, we go from 10 zettabytes to 16. That's that 5.4% growth rate in information. But the amount of data that's circulating is going off at a huge rate. And I've shown here all data in the blue dots, and I've shown structured data in the red dots. And you'll notice that unstructured data is actually the majority of the data. I used a figure of 80%. Um, this is just based on reading industry um, you know, market projections, that kind of thing. So watch your back because structured database systems deployment rates are flat to declining right now. Now, what's interesting about that is that Postgres is not flat to declining. Postgres is taking off. And in fact, the usage of Postgres for the storage of structured data is increasing. But the total industry, the total market for storing data in relational databases is actually in a flat to decline mode. Most of the growth in storage of data is in unstructured data, or not only SQL data, NoSQL data. But of course, structured and unstructured databases are going to coexist far into the future. And I think that you know, there is, there's an opportunity here for those of us who work with relational databases to really control and manage a lot of the unstructured data that's out there. And in fact, we are doing that in Insight Remote Support because a lot of the data that comes into our software is not structured. We have asynchronously arriving events. We have streams of data from devices. We have uh, files, that, files on the file system that we have to read and interpret and that we have to manage, compress, um, analyze, store, forward, and all of that would be classified as unstructured data. It's not in the database per se. The database contains metadata that refers to it that allows us to find it, to query for the chunks of unstructured data. So data goes up and information comes down. Information comes down finally to the edge devices, the laptop computers, the desktops, the, uh, the smartphones, and other devices out there. These are the devices that face the user. The difficulty always is that the network because of its size and scale and geographic dispersion in some situations like with, with uh, public cloud deployments, the network introduces a lot of lag. Lag is bad. Um, so there is an obligation here on us to do a lot of processing to reduce the data to information and get it in front of the user um, as proactively as we possibly can. And I see two counter trends in the industry. One of them is convergence, convergence toward the consolidation of computing resources into private, public, and hybrid clouds. HP is the largest provider of private clouds in this industry. Large corporations and government enterprises that want cloud-like services, uh, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, 
platform as a service, database as a service, uh, they, they have security concerns, uh, they have privacy concerns, they have concerns over guaranteeing a certain level of service to their clientele, whoever that might be, and so they want, they want privacy. Uh, and so private clouds are, are important. Um, of course, at the same time, there is a counter trend, and that's what I call diffusion. It's a trend towards the decentralization and increasingly fine-grained and optimized distribution of useful information to the edge. This is information that goes into the user's hands that's embedded in computational appliances um, and information that goes all the way to the handheld. That trend um, is really the opposite flow from the convergence trend. But what I'm pointing out is on the convergence side, it's more data. On the diffusion side, it's more information, reduced data, useful data. So edge devices require a significant amount of local storage, local processing power, and capacity to communicate. So I think there's a lot of opportunities at the edge because that's where the growth is. Just like a tree, if you observe a tree or any plant growing, you see the growth is happening at the outer edges. And the network, the worldwide network of computers is growing at ex extreme rates at the edge. 80% of the information that's stored on the devices is likely to be unstructured, but that doesn't mean it's disorganized. So our job as users of Postgres, I think, is to keep our eye on the growth in unstructured data, the growth at the edge, and to, to use the power that we have at our disposal with relational databases to manage this unstructured data going forward. I think that we have to invert the client-server relationship in some situations, in some applications, making the edge devices, like your handhelds, not just clients of the centralized system, but also servers to their peers, enabling mutual access to information caches. I haven't seen very many instances of this being done where for example, my smartphone and your smartphone are sharing information directly. Maybe through a cell tower, okay. Maybe through the Wi-Fi network, sure. But directly in the sense that without any interplay with a centralized server at, out in California, say, for example. So I think that Postgres has the potential to support very high availability and high scalability solutions at the edge um, because that's, that's where the growth is, that's where the capacity is increasing, and I, I see growth in that area. And so to achieve all that, we need to have processing power at the edge and the bandwidth and the storage capacity, uh, but how do we as the implementers of this technology, how do we support that? How do we exploit that opportunity? I think, first of all, we have to reduce unstructured data to metadata for queries because a lot of the unstructured data that's out there is not indexed, it's not organized in a way that facilitates queries. And so reducing the vast amount of data to the key things, the indexing things that allow us to look it up is tremendously important. So we need the structured data for relational manipulation, but that original data, the raw data, may be coming to us in an unstructured form. We need to validate and compress the data, reject invalid data, discard irrelevant data, expunge expired data, do deduplication, 
compression. Again, metadata is the key to querying on compressed data. And we need to focus on transforming all this enormous amount of data into useful information. We need to analyze raw data to extract relevant facts and near facts. And that's what we're doing with our remote support software. We're taking a huge amount of data from the edge devices of your server, from the storage devices, the networks, the uh, controllers, um, everything that's connected to the machine. We're taking all this data and reducing it to what's, what requires service and what can we ignore. And so what we're doing is we're moving the analytical intelligence that we have about how our devices work and how they fail sometimes and how they can be most efficiently repaired and placed back into service. And we take that intelligence and we're pushing it out as close to the edge as we can. It's not all centralized at our data center. We're figuring out what's wrong with your server and what, what board needs to be replaced or what disk controller is having a problem. We're figuring that out right on your server by deploying our knowledge base and our analysis engine right out to your machine. So I think this is a key example here with Insight Remote Support of, of using this technology, deploying the intelligence as far out to the edge as possible. Now, it's not applicable in every case. In some cases, the data is so critical that you have to have a central location. It could be financial applications, maybe billing applications, I don't know. Uh, maybe you need to use synchronous replication capabilities that are now available in order to do certain critical updates with the central system. But there, is a lot of, there are a lot of applications where things can be done at the edge. Also, we need to take advantage of the bandwidth that's available. The key idea is that whenever possible, you want to migrate the most valuable information predictively and proactively to the edges where it is most likely to be consumed. So what information has the greatest value? Well, it's, it's a pro the value, as I would rank it, is it's the utility or the usefulness of the information to the consumer of the information multiplied by the usage. So if you have a report that's being read by 100 people, that's 100 times as valuable as a report, the same report being read by one person, perhaps, in this model. So you want to improve the value of information by constructing it so that it's as useful as possible, omitting irrelevant things. You want to increase the number of users who are able to take advantage of the information. Now, the second bullet, or the third bullet here is key. The utility measure for information is, in, in my model, is the usefulness times the accessibility but diminished by the latency. So if the information is really useful but you can't get at it because you have a lot of barriers to access, that reduces the utility of the information. You want to make the data as available as it should be to the people who are entitled to see it. But perhaps more important is you need it now. So latency has to be minimized. So by the, the point here is that as we move towards the edge, as we move our processing and our data towards the edge of the network, we are creating a capability to access the data expeditiously at the edge because edge devices themselves comprise a cache that can store the data that we need. And that reduces latency. To the extent that we do not depend on a transaction with a central server, to the extent that we can make the data available right on the device, uh, we're ahead of the game. And then finally, we have the storage capacity. 
I mentioned caching information locally. For example, a, a Postgres database cluster on a local node could be a cache containing parts of a globally distributed enterprise database. I see the smartphone having an instance of a database server and that allows me as a, as a field person to be able to complete an entire transaction with a customer all on my device. It's like the FedEx guy who scans your package when he delivers it. This is the kind of capability I'm talking about, but being deployed on a wider scale. Um, caches can avoid network access. Uh, cache misses can invoke queries to remote peers for cache updates. I talked about my smartphone doesn't talk to your smartphone directly, but in some future world I see where our local devices that we carry around with us or that we keep on our desks, that those devices are going to have so much bandwidth, so much processing power, and so much storage capacity that they're going to be able to share each other's resources in, in order to improve performance at the user's point. And then uh, there's this idea of pre-rendering, I call it, uh, materialized views, creating, if, if not an image, at least a pre-image of what would be presented to a user for quick access. This requires anticipating queries. I think that if you monitor your database and you look at the queries that take place, and if you observe the patterns of the queries in your database, you could probably predict what kind of queries are going to happen when before they happen. So if you have the technology in place in your, in your application software to anticipate queries, you can do them before they're needed and have the data ready to render to your users and dramatically improve your performance. So if there's one thing I'd want you to take away from this talk is that Postgres can be deployed with client applications. That's what we're doing with Insight Remote Support. Uh, if client applications can benefit from the presence of a local database server, then certainly Postgres can be deployed as a component. Uh, the binaries today take up less than 30 megabytes. Certainly would fit on your phone. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's not even needed in an embedded application. The local server on the edge device could function as a persistent cache. It could improve the performance that the client sees. It could reduce network load. The local server could permit operations to continue while network connection to the central server is down. Now, I've heard it all about critical transactions and the necessity of having things centralized, and yes, there are some things like that. But there are also a lot of things that are not like that. And if you're just trying to inform somebody, like in a read-only state of what, you know, what does their report look like at this moment, how busy is my website, that kind of thing, there certainly are opportunities here. Um, conceivably, local servers can replicate to peers. My phone can replicate to your phone and vice versa if we perhaps share the same service that has that capability. Um, and certainly to a centralized server for redundancy. And not everything has to be replicated. You can be selective about what you replicate. And now with 9.1 in Postgres, we can do things synchronously where we have to. So that's the bottom line. Uh, if you want more information, these links will be in the PDF. You can read more about Insight Remote Support, about our IT services at HP. Uh, our products and service offerings. And this very good report out of uh, UC San Diego, how much information, report on enterprise server information, I highly recommend that you read that if you're interested, as I am, in industry trends. Uh, some of the figures that I mentioned uh, come from that report. And that's available for download on the web. Thank you very much. Questions?